the section of um, the afternoon, you're talking about the relevance of PBE. And I came up with this title, and um, I struggled with that title, but I'll start with it. So making practice-based education matter. What I want to do is to start with a simple <coughs> view of uh, practice-based education and then problematize it by drawing on research done uh, by EFPI and drawing on the good, will, uh, the good practice in will report and social conditions that actually contextualize PDE and the conditions under which we have to um, teach and conceptualize PDE. And then I'll suggest at the end some possibilities for making PBE matter by considering the conditions that enable participation, authenticity, reflection and dialogues, some of the key pillars of PBE. And the aim is to contribute to the debate about making PBE relevant. So as a common language within CSU, we do not use the term will we make a distinction between PBE and WPL, or Workplace Learning Ways, the World Association of Cooperative Education, um, the Office of Learning and Teaching, and ASIN do not make this distinction, and they call PBE and WPL all WIN. So PBE is an approach to education, and workplace learning provides supervised workplace experiences for students, like David said, it's their place where some learning happens. Making this distinction highlights the focus of PBE on pedagogy, curriculum and practice, and workplace learning as a strategy of <coughs> PBE that occurs in the workplace. So I'll talk about PBE and WPL. Now, I don't very often ask myself, does PBE matter? Because the answer is, of course it matters. Industry, pressure um, universities to contribute to the skilled workforce and the economy. They want ready access to capable graduates. Professional accreditation bodies demand that students reach con um, prescribed competencies and that the courses adhere to their content requirements. Governments want universities to also contribute to social and environmental well-being. University funding these days has many strings attached. The protected elitist university from the 19th and 20th, uh, 20th century is long gone. Students themselves are increasingly career oriented and their prime goal for university education is to obtain a license to practice and obtain employability and employment. Universities need to prepare students for work and are measured against graduate employability. And the key agenda for universities around the globe is to produce skilled, educated, and resourceful workforce. PBE is a key focus of many universities in Australia. Increasingly, PBE is seen as a key indicator for good university education. PBE is expanding and ASIN is growing. Macquarie University is in the vanguard with others in making WPL mandatory. CSU has established EFPI. So practice-based education seems to be the ideal response to current demands by university stakeholders. PBE places professional practice and preparation for work at the center of education and makes university education relevant to students, employers, accreditation bodies, and industry. It brings the world of work into the classroom by creating a bridge between the university and the workplace. And by helping universities traverse into the workplace and back, PBE can be seen as a solution to overcoming the ivory tower reputation, elitism, isolation, and perceived academic irrelevance. So in the last 10 to 15 years, we have witnessed an increased workplace learning activity. Often these innovative workplace learning models and practical strategies appear to be an add-on to the course and more importantly, to the course curriculum. <coughs> Workplace learning does not align well with the pedagogy of the rest of the curriculum. This increased workplace learning activity has ignited a debate about what counts as legitimate academic knowledge and research, and what is the role and the purpose of universities in this. So I'm asking myself, have we adopted workplace learning and forgotten about PBE? Have we too quickly adopted workplace learning to please the university <coughs> stakeholders without long-term visions for PBE? 
And what's the purpose of PBE from a higher education perspective? The confusion and meaning of meanings behind the many terms that are interchangeably used for PBE, such as, and I won't mention them yet again, <laughs> There may be an indicator that there is a lack of clarity and of purpose. <coughs> so to shed more light onto making PBE matter for universities, I conducted a meta-analysis of research conducted through EFPI. In, an, in my review, I searched for the challenges of PBE that universities face. I draw on four studies, two conducted with workplace learning academics, one with students, and one with workplace learning supervisors. So in one study, we explored how physiotherapists who supervise students in hospitals perceived their own assessment practices and what they had to say about the support they received from the university. The challenges that universities face is to prepare everybody for assessments, making sure students, workplace learning supervisors, and academics are clear of the criteria and the purposes of assessment. Our participants struggled with the dual role of mentor and assessor. They actually said assessing is an emotional practice and it is very difficult for, the, for them to reconcile competing interests. And rather than working through these challenges, they chose to resort to their professional authority when they ran into difficulties with students. They reversed back to an evidence-based assessment uh, regime rather than being courageous and using a bit more judgment-based assessments. And they consistently ask that universities provide more dialogue and training. <coughs> Forms and guidelines were not effective substitutes. In another study, we explored reflective practice in the transition from student to graduate. And students told us they valued academic preparation for reflection in the workplace. We're doing that well. But once in the workplace, students felt they depended heavily on the supervisor's skill to facilitate collective reflection. So the nature of the supervisor-student relationship was perceived as crucial. In another study, we explored how academics prepare students for international placements. We asked what pedagogical purpose academics give to international experiences and how they integrated these experiences into intercultural learning and addressing global citizenship. The majority of the academics focused on process issues and left students to make sense of their experiences themselves. This potentially reinforces negative cultural stereotyping. And only few mention the international placements as an opportunity to develop global citizenship and intercultural competence. There was a need to embed international placements in a pedagogy with clear intercultural learning guidance and a practice purpose. Now, in another study on academic workplace learning leadership, the people who worked with our workplace learning participants were invited to, to provide feedback about our participants' leadership capabilities. Stronger scores were attributed to the leadership role of delivering and, men and monitoring workplace learning programs. These roles focus on process. The feedback results provided evidence that academic workplace learning coordinators are passionate, organized, timely, and good administrators. The weaker scores were consistently attributed to the broker and innovator roles, which relate to engaging with industry, networking, influencing, and negotiating good workplace learning environments for students. And also, there was a lack of recognition uh, of the participants themselves, that they should be, see themselves as leaders, because workplace learning is sort of a process driven add-on to the curriculum. These challenges in workplace learning highlight that we need to depart from a focus on process and experience. Workplace learning without a PBE curriculum and pedagogy will encounter shortfalls. They also show that traversing to the workplace isn't easy. Worlds are colliding in workplace learning. Students, industry, and academia all bring different agendas and purposes to student learning. These challenges point to the competing interests and cultural clashes. They clearly show that workplace learning cannot be an add-on to the curriculum, neither can we assume that the world out there shares our purposes. 
the social condition under which universities need to operate can explain maybe some of those difficulties. <coughs> Bauman coined the term liquid modern times. He implies that we live in volatile, constantly changing circumstances where social structures and practices liquefy before they solidify. Some of these conditions mean the collapse of long-term thinking, a collapse of inclusion of minority groups, and a focus on short-term goals and individual responsibility. These conditions do not offer meaning to work and life. In fact, they potentially discard meaning. The great conceptual ideas of PBE, to prepare students for citizenship and ethical practice and to foster critical thinking and to include the diversity of student groups, all prove difficult to implement. Now, in her Good Practice in Will report, funded by the ALTC, General confirmed these challenges. She identified the need to make Will accessible to underrepresented student groups. Access to work placements will need to be even more amplified now with the introduction of demand driven funding with unkept students' loans. And universities need to focus on retaining students. This is made even more complex with universities being pressured to increase the enrollment of underrepresented student groups. And Jan lists university responsibilities for workplace learning that address access and resource issues, but also the need for mutual benefit of workplace learning programs and sufficient preparation so students from diverse backgrounds can all fully participate in and learn from workplace learning experiences. And it seems these responsibilities can only be honored in a just society. Governments are struggling with environmental and financial crises, and industry needs are changing rapidly, and so are universities. Volatile conditions impact on academics and workplace learning teachers. We are not immune. At last year's CSUA conference, Stephen Chemist wished for more calm in academia, and he received a standing ovation for his <laughs> remark. And at the CSUA 2010, Ron Barnett talked about the courage to go on in these uncertain times. So from these dismal social conditions outlined by Bauman and the steep university responsibilities outlined by Jan, let's move to creating possible conditions for participation, dialogue, and reflection. And in <coughs> times of crisis and persisting obstacles, we cannot do without a critical perspective. Now, the critical paradigm pays particular attention to problematizing the challenges and problems that have been identified. Problem posing is at the foreground because it suspends quick superficial solutions and exposes the deeper causes and interrelationships of practices. It does this by questioning the rationale behind current practices. Problem posing reveals the level of reflection and awareness of people. It exposes the rationale and motivation behind decision making, lines of responsibility, and hierarchical relations. By exploring current practices with a brutally open and honest attitude, people begin to understand why they find themselves in difficult situations. Critique is not something negative directed towards others. Critique problematizes current situations in order to get to the roots of issues. This is participatory collective reflection. <coughs> now, the theory of communicative action postulates three ideal conditions for participation, dialogue, and reflection, and they are listed here. To create these conditions, sophisticated skills of self-reflection, respect for others, and willingness to uphold reason on power are necessary. Habermas developed these conditions because he was skeptical that participation and dialogue in itself could lead to better outcomes, democratic relations, and emancipation. Dialogue and participation are buzzwords that can easily be misused. There is a danger that discussions and staff training might be stifling, especially when they are conducted within taken, from, taken for granted value frameworks and rigid power relations. Without questioning existing value frameworks and work practices, real change will not eventuate. So as academics, we can choose an easy strategy. 
ignore the volatile conditions and challenges, pretend they do not exist, teach towards standard requirements and student satisfaction uh, surveys. And the slogan would be, do not resist new developments, do not question, stay neutral and join the dominant discourse. Now this, this choice means teaching towards, and I apologize, to a one-dimensional, not neutral, nondescript, uncommitted, <coughs> unimaginative, objective, skill-oriented, rule-following practice. Such <coughs> BBE has, sh has short-term endpoints, and it plays to students' short-term goals and industries' immediate needs. It would not prepare students for the world of work in the future. And being aware of these conditions of liquid modern times requires a PBE that focuses on preparing students for uncertain and rapid change. Learning is not straightforward and it is not a smooth journey, but a neutral and orderly PBE has no place at universities. Another strategy is to engage with these conditions. It might sound ridiculous to choose the first easy option, but it is hard to choose the alternative because you may need to be prepared for resistance by colleagues, students, and initially hostile welcomes in the, in the industry. You should focus on teaching about purpose, interests, and assumptions that shape practice. And Stephen Billet's workplace um, pedagogy strongly points to the need for purpose, engagement, and participation. To do this, educators and students need to talk with each other. Ideal conditions for dialogue are when people speak the <coughs> truth and not to power. And the purpose is to develop bold students who ask difficult questions, who dare to challenge themselves, and who are willing to explore other possibilities. Fearful, submissive students seek certainty in uncertain times, and submit to others, and worse, become cynical and lose their will to learn. So in conclusion, PBE can be the curriculum and the communicative space for engagement and participation. PBE can be the meaning-making space where students integrate what they experience in the workplace. They can question, challenge, and shape critical identity. PBE is not a magical solution. It's full of challenges, but we can see it as an opportunity and a response to liquid modern times. Making PBE matter is not easy. It implies a curriculum and pedagogy shift, well, a real paradigm shift. It requires wise university leaders teachers who can act upon critical awareness of <coughs> situations, agentic <coughs> learners who seek out opportunities, and workplace learning supervisors who are supported to learn and help students learn. Becoming aware of challenges doesn't solve anything. We need to find courage in following them up with action. So PBE is an appropriate shift from developing public intellectuals to developing critical citizens and from academic scholars to embracing academic activism. Thank you.